So let me let me start the um, start the um, session. I should be see the invited lunch and keynote session here. Uh, my name is Gijun Nam from IBM Research, but today I'm wearing a hat, CEDA hat here, and presenting as um, CEDA Technical Activity Chair. And welcome everyone here. Uh, you, you still can enjoy your, your lunch while I'm talking. Uh, uh, before the main event starts, let me briefly um, go over the um, CEDA introduction slides over here because this event is sponsored by CEDA. <clears throat> So, as you might know, CDAR is an acronym for IEEE Council on Electronic Design Automation. And CDAR was formed in 2005 to be the uh, kind of the focal point of the, all the activities within the IEEE related to electronic design automation. And CDAR has these um, eight um, parent societies, like antennas and propagation, CAS, circuits and systems, computer, electronic de devices, microwave theory and techniques, solid state circuits, electronics, packaging. But point is, you know, CEDA is trying to be the um, leading provider in IEEE of technical information and community services in design automation of electronic embedded system. And moreover, recently we started kind of in expand our horizons to address the new emerging areas such as um, IoT and cybersecurity system, embedded system, etc. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, as you might know, CEDA has uh, these um, three sponsoring three publications. The um, IEP transaction and computer aided uh, design TCAT basically. Uh, also, we are sponsoring design and test magazine as well as the um, embedded system newsletters. Next slide. Also, CEDA provides a couple of awards to recognize, you know, important recognition, technical recognition, as well as the um, individual accomplishment, such as Phil Kaufman Award. Richard Newton Technical Impact Award, um, Donald Patterson Best Paper Award based on the TCAT papers. And some of these awards, you, you have seen the um, recipients of the, um, these awards during the um, ICCAD um, general session, opening session here. Next slide. <clears throat> and I think um, David Atienja, who is a CEDA president, already made some <laughs> advertisement during the general session, introductory session, but we are kind of looking for the um, nomination for these particularly two um, awards. One is Ernest Ku Early Co Career Award to recognize important technical contribution. Also, um, Richard Newton Technical Impact Award in Electronic Design Automation for the um, technical contribution to the field based on the publication. So I think the nomination due date is April 15th. So if you have someone in mind, please feel free to uh, let us know. CEDA basically provides services and activities to the um, community through these channels. As you might know, we established um, distinguished lecture programs that started in 2016. Also, we support various EDA-related conferences and workshops, and some of them you already saw those events here. For example, ICCAT contest event that was sponsored by CEDA, which has a special session yesterday. And also, we are, we are willing to support any EDA-related activities. So if you have any new idea or interesting new initiative, please let us know. And I think Probably finally, um, CEDA has about 15 local chapters in worldwide, and we are trying to kind of uh, provide um, services for the community through these local chapters, and Distinguished Lecture Program is a good vehicle to use um, those um, resources to host you know, lectures to these um, local chapters to provide yeah, more material to the regional areas. With that, <coughs> 
let me get back to the uh, main topic of this session. It is great pleasure for me to introduce um, Andreas Orofsen as a, I should see the uh, Ronchan, invited Ronchan keynote speaker today. Um, as you might know, Andreas joined uh, DARPA as a program manager in the microsystems technology offices in January 2017. And his interests include intelligent design automation, system optimization, and open hardware. And also, uh, DARPA has a pretty big program going on called ERI, and Andreas is one of the um, program managers under that program, which I think the uh, major topic of this presentation. So, uh, Andreas, please take it over here. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm at DARPA. I've been there for two years now. Um, a DARPA assignment is temporary. You're there from anywhere from two to five years, and then they kick you out. So everybody has an expiration date on their badge. Um, I came from industry. I designed chips for 20 years. Um, and I decided to start a program to serve my own needs first, right? I was tired of designing chips uh, with an enormous amount of effort. So. Um, I'm going to talk about a, a new concept that we started, or not a new concept, but a, a new effort we started in the area of silicon compilers, and I want to talk about what that could do. But uh, let's uh, roll back the clock a little bit, right? So first transistor ever invented, this was kind of the pre-EDA area, right? Uh, you don't need EDA to uh, glue materials together. Um, and you can name every person working on that project, right? So, you know, by first name, by last name. And um, you go forward to 2018, right? What does it take to make a state-of-the-art design today? Take something like the AMD Epic, 20 billion transistors or so, uh, miles of wiring. Um, it's a beast, right? Teraflops of, of performance. But it takes a village, right? Hundreds of people to get it right. Um, possibly $500 million, thousands of men, uh, engineering years. And so... How do we get from that first transistor to here, right? Is this, is this an optimum? So I think, you know, for this community, right, you probably appreciate that picture. Um, I would, you know, this is sort of why I came to DARPA, and this is what DARPA does sometimes, right? So we try to see if we can kind of nudge a, an ecosystem out of equilibrium to see if we can find a better optimum. Because in our industry, right, Moore's Law and everything around it, everything's driven by economics. Everything's driven by profit. And sometimes that reaches the best solution. Um, sometimes it doesn't, right? So uh, I'm going to see if I can kind of tweak the system a little bit to get, to, get, to get a better optimum for everybody. So, so how do we get there? Right? How do we get to this uh, um, optimum, which may be local or global? Uh, so I want to compare software and hardware and, and where we've gone in the last 70 years. So in terms of productivity, mostly. Uh, so in software, we used to have human compilers, right? People who program machines by, uh, uh, you know, pulling wires, configuring uh, the machine itself. That became very tedious. People got upset. They started designing compilers, right? So you don't want to program in ones and zeros. Um, you know, assemblers weren't good enough, so we had higher level languages. You know, at, after that point, right, it's just about scale, right? So people invented object-oriented programming. and. Uh, some people thought that was too difficult to get their, wrap their heads around. We need something that's easier, right? So things like Python and Perl and Tickle were invented more, you know, to make things easier to scale the community rather than to scale one person in, in a certain dimension. And of course, today, Python is the most widely used language in the world, uh, Googled more than Kim Kardashian, apparently. Um, and so, but it has a thriving community, right? So one of the lessons here is that there's a networking effect, right? You know, like, and you have a true kind of scientific sharing where one thing begets another along those ways. And there's been other things as well, right? You look at the operating system, right? Uh, uh, 
Unix, right, invented a Bell Lab, C programming language, right? Um, and then Unix wasn't open enough, so somebody got upset. So Richard Stallman invented GNU um, and the open source software movement. And then, you know, somebody wasn't upset with Richard's progress, so they started Linux. Um, and then, um, you know, Sun decided that they want software to run on any hardware platform. Um, and then Android becomes, and is open source, derived from Linux, becomes the dominant operating system in the world for mobile platforms. So you, you kind of see this kind of non-linear, weird uh, effects of having a community that uh, is not closed. Another example, Ericsson, right, uh, had to drive their, semi, uh, their telecom equipment in the 80s. They had to program it for high levels of robustness, right, so fault tolerance. So they vented Airline, uh, opened it up as a, as a programming language, and you know, 20 or 30 years later, you know, 50 guys uh, and gals uh, create a company and sell it for 20 billion dollars, right? That's a that's a very non-obvious uh, uh, result, right? And not connected at all. One was a telecom company, the other one was running a messaging app in in the cloud, uh, but but building on different on the same infrastructure. So, I want to keep that in mind. That's a software world, right? Amazing results, uh, amazing progress has continued over time. Hardware is much more difficult. Uh, we're dealing with physics. And so we need to do similar things. So if we go back to the first transistor, in the beginning there was uh, pretty much no NDA, e EDA. There was no need for it. This was you know, initial discovery. But then people got tired of solving uh, differential equations and writing down circuits by paper and pencil, right? So there were spy simulators. Uh, people got tired of doing Carnot maps uh, by hand, so there was logic synthesis. Uh, people got tired of constructing these kind of uh, um, math systems uh, uh, time after time, so Carl Rubin and others came up with silicon compilers. Uh, and of course, from there, you know, you can see kind of the higher level abstraction, and it kept going. But I would say that, unlike software, each battle has been, you know, very, very uh, hard fought. Right? People have worked very hard to solve these problems algorithmically. Many people in this room. But we haven't had the kind of networking effect we've had in software. So the, the end result is that we have a bit of a productivity plateau, pl plateau in hardware. Right? We're stuck behind um, uh, sh you know, limitations on sharing. Um, and, uh, and so the end result, right? today everybody knows that chip design is very, very expensive um, and uh, is not tracked with Moore's law. So if you look at you know, what's, the, what's the problem at the end of the day, we have so many transistors today uh, we have billions of transistors, and our brains haven't scaled with it, right? So we need more people to kind of wrap our, our, our hands around the problem, and, uh, and that translates to cost. Uh, so my question, right, and I, started, and I asked when I came to DARPA, is why can't we have this, right? Why can't we have a true silicon compiler? And I'm not talking about a silicon compiler like the one that uh, Carl Mead and others were talking about in the 1980s, which was brittle and very function-specific. I'm talking about a compiler like GCC, right, or LLVM, where you, you have a language that is broad enough that you can express almost any circuit, and then you push the button, you get an executable out. That's what I want. Um, so, so now DARPA's Electronic Resurgence Initiative, right? So uh, by Bill Chappell at DARPA uh, realized, right, that Moore's Law only ends once. And so uh, that's a pretty big uh, um, disruption to everything that we've taken for granted for, for 50 years. And uh, so he convinced uh, um, the government, or the, the other part of the government, to give us a lot of money, right, to, to fund a major initiative in electronics in the U.S. So we're talking in $1.5 billion uh, total investment over four years. And uh, this was kicked off last year officially. We had a summit in July in San Francisco. Um, six programs, new programs kicked off. Um, I have two of those programs uh, in the area of design that I'm going to talk about today. But uh, there's going to be a lot more programs coming in this area over the next few years. So, <clears throat> you know, why do I think this is important, right? Why this is the time? Uh, well, so the first thing is I used to run a, a, a parallel processor company for nine years before joining DARPA. And uh, I know everybody who's worked in that industry knows that you get steamrolled by the CPU, right? Because the CPU you see here, it's improving so fast that imagine somebody writes a program and you have kind of compound interest of that program improving year over year without doing anything. That's an amazing thing. 
how can you compete with that with a new architecture that you have to kind of re-spin out every year? So, so that, that that's what drove the CPU dominance over many decades. It was hard to compete with that. Today, if that's slowing down, that's going to change the economics, uh, of, uh, and that's, economics changes everything. The second one is I never want anybody to forget about Amdahl's law. I was talking to a, um, a quantum computing expert who uh, told me that uh, you know, he can get a million times speed up on a certain problem. And I was skeptical, and I said, what about Amdahl's law? And he asked me, what's Amdahl's law? Um, that was the end of that conversation. Um, so uh, the next one I don't want us to forget about is, is flexibility versus power. Um, so um, there's no silver bullet, right? If you want programmability, you're going to pay something for it. Uh, that might be, uh, you know, you're going to have an extra number of muxes or wires or flip-flops, but program programmability and flexibility has a finite cost rooted in physics. And so, uh, so ASICs are always going to beat um, domain-specific devices. And domain-specific devices, which are less flexible, are always going to beat FPGAs or uh, true FPGAs or uh, CPUs. So, so let's just let's call that a fact. <coughs> so if scaling is slowing down, right, we don't have, uh, you know, um, then our scaling is dead. Then if we truly are going after swap-limited, size, weight, and power-limited applications, then there are times when we should do ASICs. And for 20 years now, I've heard, no, we don't do ASICs because it's too expensive. It's always because it's too expensive. Well, what if it wasn't expensive? That would change a lot of people's minds about what kind of circuits we should design and what kind of applications we could do. So just to give an illustration of, you know, this is, this is a toy example, but uh, I think it works. So let's say we have, you know, uh, a bank of flip-flops, right, that we can program with weights, uh, you know, numbers. And then we have a, a multiplier, right, that, that multiplies those weights by, by an input data stream. And so this, this could be an, this is basically an application-specific circuit. Somebody would, some people might call it an ASIC. But what happens if we truly hard-code constants, right? Well, first of all, all those flip-flops go away. It's just going to be replaced by pull-ups and pull-downs to uh, uh, power and ground. And then if you look at the multiplier, a lot of that logic can be uh, optimized, as way as, uh, optimized away as well, right? If you multiply by a 1, the multiplier goes away. Multiply by 0, the whole thing goes away, and it propagates forward. Uh, in the arithmetic. So you can easily have a 10x difference between ASIC and a programmable ASIC. Um, and then there are times when 10x matters, right? One kilo versus 10 kilo payload, right, in terms of liftoff um, and, and so forth. So um, I think it should be pretty clear that if we had a silicon compiler that was, you know, zero cost for, for implementation, if we had the code, that, that might change the space and what we can do. So we're investing $100 million. These are programs that kicked off in June of this year. Uh, and uh, basically in, in, in two areas. The first one is creating a Verilog and schematic to GDS2, meaning you know, basically a layout generator, no human layout generation. And the second one is once we have that compiler, we want a way to link in libraries. So if you think of a C compiler, the C compiler is not very interesting unless you have a rich ecosystem of libraries that you can reuse code. So at the end, at the end of the day, we should have something like this. This is the end goal of the program. So it's a four-year program. We should have something like this at the end. <coughs> so we have 22 teams working on this all together, uh, split evenly between academia and, and commercial partners. and. Uh, I really like the teams we have here. Uh, it, we've been working on it for three months. Um, it's been awesome so far. We've got very, very uh, progressive thinkers from academia specifically, and we have a, a lot of scars and pain and knowledge from the industry from having designed chips in the past. So, so that combination makes for a, a great partnership. So how are things done today? So I think one of the things we're cha challenged with is the fact that we have so much knowledge built into you know, our human brains across the design industry uh, to drive these tools and get these chips right, uh, first time right. Uh, chips right, packages right, boards right. And so you know, how, do we, how do we take that and automate it, right? How do we take the humans out of the loop? And, uh, and the approach we're taking is you know, not exactly novel, right? But we're going we're gonna to throw data at the problem. And, uh, 
the idea is that, um, first of all, we're going to unify the layout front. And so in the past, we've had different domains, one domain for IC design, one domain for package, and one domain for board. If we're going to spend $100 million to connect um, components with pins on them, with conductors, using a, you know, dielectrics and metal stack up, then we should unify that. Right? What I just described could be a package, a board, or an IC. The geometries are different, the constraints are different, but the fundamental problem of connecting pins with conductors is the same in some, in some optimal fashion. So, so the thesis here is that if we have enough data, right, and we can curate that data, that we should be able to come up with a solution that is uh, as good as, uh, as humans. Now, this doesn't mean that we're going to throw away all the you know, 30 or 40 years of EDA research we've done. It's going to be some combination. At the end of the day, this is an optimization problem um, that is meant to be um, general purpose. So to give you an idea of some of the knowledge that needs to be built in, this is, and this is really part of the DARPA hard portion of the program, um, take analog layout. Right? Can we a automate analog layout? Uh, so digital layout, we know that we've had uh, optimized place and route for a long time now. It's almost automated. So there are some gaps in there. But for analog, we really don't have automated place and route for layout in production today. And so you know, what does it look like? So in a circuit designer, right, we'll go in and create a clever topology for an op amp or a differential amplifier, whatever, and, and use his or her knowledge of, you know, how circuits work, what's state of the art, what's the process, uh, what does the simulation test bench look like. And, but that person's time is very, very expensive. So the layout is done by somebody else. You, a lot of times, somebody without an engineering degree, they're just pushing polygons around based on the direction of the circuit designer. And then there are rules, vocabulary, right? Well, you should, you know, should do these transistors in a centroid fashion, right? You should mirror these ones. You should isolate that portion and so forth. So you have a vocabulary. Uh, and you have a set of patterns, transistors that you localize, and, and that's kind of the feedback, right? And then you, have, you also have aesthetics, right? Things that uh, the circuit designer likes to see. That's a, that's a bit of a tricky one, but it does come into play as well. So how can we do that, right, with, with uh, an automated fashion, right? And uh, the question is, we can certainly have a vocabulary, a set of features. Uh, we can certainly extract patterns uh, from the uh, circuit. And you could imagine that if we had every circuit ever made in every node that um, we should be able to extract a lot of useful information that has been embedded in there by this relationship between the drafting person and the circuit designer, and then extract that for the n plus one circuit that we're going we're gonna to lay out. It's a bit of a leap of faith, but it's, uh, that's kind of the direction. So, so to make things even plausible with this $100 million budget, right? Because we know that the EDA industry has invested tens of billions over the years in solving some of these problems. We're saying for the, for the government purposes, for academia, for prototypes, we don't need the best-in-class chips. Area almost never matters. You know, power might matter. Uh, performance might matter sometimes. But area almost never matters. So, so we have a lot of freedom there. So what we asked for was 100% no human-the-loop automation but you know, the, the variable that you're allowed to tweak is the performance to make it easier. Because if you go say we want the best in class uh, performance and no human loop, people are doomed to fail. Um, and this is the reason why the industry has not really gone this route in the past. Because nobody would buy an EDA tool today that will give you automation but worse area. Right? A, a, a Qualcomm or a, a Broadcom lives and dies by gross margin on the silicon. And you know, if you have a bigger area, you have less gross margin, you're less profitable, it doesn't work. So that's what drives the EDA industry. So we were coming at it from a different optimization angle. Um, from a design's perspective, I think we realized that we may need to change the design principles uh, to make things uh, uh, easier for the CAD industry. So there's a bit of a co-design here of the design methodology and the EDA tools um, that come into play as well to make this tractable within $100 million. So that was the layout generation portion. Now for, um, for the LinkedIn library, here we're motivated by or, or inspired by software as well. So if you look at many of the you know, very successful Silicon Valley companies today, uh, Google and, and Facebook and others, they're really writing on top of decades of open source content, things like Linux. Uh, and uh, they would not have been able to get their uh, company off the ground without leveraging that, right? So you have a, a base 
uh, of Linux, and then layers on top of that can, that, can, that can leverage Linux. And then you have the company's secret sauce, and you have user content on, on top of that. And uh, when you look at the value being created, it, it is truly staggering. On the hardware side, we have more of a, a siloed approach, right? Because of the way IP contracts are done, we can't really share things. We can never really have a stack of more than two. Um, and in software, we can have an infinite stack. So if you think of the next generation complex system, which might have a trillion transistors, you really don't want to build a trillion transistor system with a two layer stack, right? You want to have a 10 to 20 layer stack. So each block is encapsulated by a slightly bigger block and so forth and so forth. So kind of a radix type approach. So, so we have this thesis that the only way we can create that very, very hierarchical stack is by having modifiable code and shareable code, which is open source. So um, that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to create an open source hardware ecosystem. So there's a few different thrusts in here uh, that we're working on. The first one is a, a multi-core RISC-V. So RISC-V, uh, the ISA, has been very popular for, uh, for research. Uh, uh, was kicked off by DARPA through the DARPA Perfect and Poem program, uh, or helped fund it uh, at Berkeley. But there's no implementation. So the ISA standard is open, but there's really no high performance implementation. So Michael Taylor at the University of Washington is going to uh, create that multi-core implementation. <coughs> we also need things around a risk core, right? All the building blocks, things like memory controllers, Ethernet controllers, uh, USB, and so forth. So we're creating that ecosystem as well. Um, third, for security reasons, um, and modifiability reasons, it's very useful to have a, a open FPGA platform as well. So we have three teams working to put together uh, a base, sort of like a Linux for FPGA for FP, uh, Linux for FPGAs, um, and that includes the place and route toolset as well as the architecture. And then um, on the analog IP front, um, a bunch of schools are creating ADCs, DACs, PLLs, DLLs, uh, CERTIs to create a community of analog IP sharing. So if you imagine ICCC, uh, every year there's you know, hundreds of papers being published, but nobody ever publishes source code to make sure that the paper can actually be reproduced. Right? So this is our, you know, our way of pushing the field forward. Um, and a big thing about open source, uh, whether it's digital or analog, is, is trust. So unlike software, right? Software, you download something, it doesn't work, you patch it, the incremental cost of a patch is zero. The incremental cost of a bug in hardware is you break the company. So, which is why very few people who are building commercial chips would ever take a risk on open source IP. So what we need is better analysis tools as well. So the steam, team from Stanford is really pushing the envelope in terms of ease of use of formal verification and scale of formal verification. Um, and then finally, towards the end of this program, we want to make sure this transitions into the, the commercial uh, community. Uh, so we've got uh, quite a few teams right now involved in these programs, uh, but uh, we, will, uh, we will see where it, where it goes in terms of traction. But if we want this to ever be sustainable, then clearly there needs to be a value add to the existing industry. So the program is a four-year program, kicked off in June, and uh, we are running integration exercises every six months. The first one's coming up at uh, UC San Diego in January. And the idea is that all these teams working on the, uh, the components as well as the EDA tools, uh, they, they bring their code, uh, let other people test the code, uh, bring in test cases from the government as well as from industry. Um, and then you kind of do a hackathon for a week, lessons learned at the end of the week, and then you go away again. Um, I'm, I'm very excited. This is, a, this is a new thing. This is probably, this has never been done in the hardware industry, and I'm pretty sure this hasn't been done in the EDA industry as well. So uh, this should be pretty exciting. So now I want to talk about the impact, right? Why am I, uh, why am I so excited about something like this? Um, so a little bit intro to economics of semiconductor, first of all. So that slide, the hockey stick I showed before, right, which is a bogus curve um, because, you know, there's millions of chips being, uh, thousands of chips being designed every year. So clearly you can't have a, a, a curve like that. So the cost model we see at E times and other places a lot is this kind of exponential where it seems like somebody curve fitted and they went and said, uh, you know, a 180 nanometer chip cost $500,000, and let me just do an X squared based on the technology node, and yeah, that looks about right. Maybe I'll tweak it a little bit. Um, 
And of course, chips are much more complicated than that, right? The distribution is more complicated. You have complex chips, like the AMD chip I mentioned, right? Billions of resistors, probably half a billion dollars in investment. You got this shield chip there in the middle, which is 100 micron by 100 micron. It's tiny, not very complex. That's not going to cost 500 million. It costs less than 5 million. And then you have a chip that I designed, right? Designed pretty much by myself in one year. Four billion transistors, but it had an insane amount of replication. I only had four hard macros in the whole block, and I would just Lego that. Uh, so that was trivial. That's not really a four billion transistor design. It's more like a one million transistor design. So, um, so when you look at those things, you realize, well, okay, so we need a much more complicated cost model, uh, and, and there are many, many variables. Um, and you know, you've got transistor count, which technology node, whether it's mixed signal or digital, is it programmable or an ASIC, because that drives the software cost. It, you know, there's a lot of replication, like what I did with, uh, with my chip. Um, are you running at 500 megahertz or five gigahertz? Um, is this a product or a prototype, right? That's gonna, you know, in terms of verification, makes it has a big impact and so forth, right? So how was I able to do a $1 million uh, chip um, uh, at 60 nanometer? Well, I was on the easy end on a lot of those parameters. And the industry in EDA is optimized for the other side. So, so we have a kind of a disconnect here, uh, but we're definitely gonna lav uh, leverage some of the easier concepts for, the, for, for a silicon compiler. So just to give you some numbers, right? These are not uh, um, official numbers. We just, these kind of hearsay or you know, Google numbers or you know, through the grapevine. Um, but if you compare 180 nanometer and FinFET, right? And university versus product, uh, you see the huge range. Um, and I'm trying to do an apples to apples, same design here, like what would it look like? Um, and uh, you see that you can do a prototype with a you know, couple of grad students, probably for $500,000 uh, in 180. At, uh, at, at, uh, for a commercial product, you need more verification, characterization, so that's gonna go up to, let's say, a couple of million. And then a FinFET, EDA tools are gonna be more expensive, and mass costs are gonna be more expensive, right? Uh, but it's not $100 million for the same design. You can make it as complex as you want, right? So the sky's the limit. But, uh, but th those give you some kind of ballpark numbers. But again, only like, you know, really uh, uh, swags. So how close to zero can we get, right, if we really try to push it? <coughs> well, if we bring the design and verification to zero by just, you know, again, git clone and make, right, we reuse the whole thing, that goes to zero. The best, the best code you write is the code that you don't write. Bring the software cost to zero. Uh, so firmware and things like that. Uh, leveraging standard tool chains. This is a little bit like the, the RISC-V uh, view, right? Uh, the fact that you have a common ISA means that I can download Debian, I can download GCC, LVM. Somebody's done that for me. So that goes to zero. EDA could be brought to zero if the silicon compiler, parts of the silicon compiler works. <coughs> Nothing's ever free. So there's a caveat there. Somebody has to fund that development to get that to zero, but somebody could benefit from it. <coughs> Excuse me. And test costs you can possibly bring to zero as well. <coughs> but I get the question, what about mass costs? Well, mass costs are high. Let's say $10 million at FinFET. But that's for the full, full reticle. What if I don't need a lot of units? You know, how, how, how much get, do I have to pay? Well, the reticle is, let's say, 700 square millimeters. So you do, if you want one square millimeter, <coughs> you divide the reticle cost by your fraction. <coughs> Multiply the, the reticle by your fraction. So it turns out that you can get a million transistors that only exist, you know, as a one-time chip, one-of-a-kind chip, for less than $500 if you do the math. You know, assuming that the engineering involved with that is zero. <coughs> so the next time you, s you hear somebody say that there's an ASIC for that costs, you know, $100 million to develop or $50 million, you say, well, if I have the code, I could actually get an ASIC for $500. That's a big difference. So what can we do with that? What can we do with a $500 ASIC? So it's kind of a, a truism that things at low volume, things that are customized, are very expensive. Um, and so there's a space in there that is, you know, that's the disruption space, right? Things that are going to be low cost and low volume. And we've seen 3D printers 
go into that space, right? Uh, the n equal one, build one of something um, at a low cost. And chip design, we actually sort of have that already. We could have that. How do we have that? Well, the factories today are, <coughs> are no touch, right? I mean, they're all, all robots, all tracks, right? There's nobody's handling wafers anywhere. So it almost looks like an Amazon cloud, but for chips. And certainly for, for computing, everything is automated. The only problem is that even if we have the code, right, the Verilog code and schematics, we we'll still need, you know, this layout army to create the chip. But if we have a no human in the loop, then we have end-to-end -end automation. So then we can actually fill that reticle with tiny, tiny chiplets. So, you know, the general purpose silicon compiler does two things. One, it democratizes access to silicon technology. Meaning, what does that mean? It means that you don't need people like me, chip design experts with 20 years experience to design a chip, a software person, a math person, algorithm person, if they can write code, everything else is hidden, right? So perfect abstraction layer, not perfect performance, but it, it, it gets the job done. Just like a compiler today, you do not know how to, you don't need to know how the compiler works to write code. Um, you don't even know, need to know how hardware works to write, co uh, write code, right? Look at Python. I would say that 99% of the people who write Python don't know anything about hardware. Um, <coughs> And second, you replace human time with, with machine cycles. So, um, so you know, you, instead of having a layout army, you have a, a, you know, a warehouse scale data center just for doing layout. So what's the outcome? Well, once we take the human out of the loop, we can scale, right? So we can actually imagine things like, uh, instead of having one design that's replicated across a reticle, if I'm a, you know, let's say I'm designing a, uh, a product platform, I can design a tiled one unique processor per, per person or per, per application to fill that reticle. Because it doesn't cost me anything more than machine cycles to do that layout. And uh, you know, I, I think that here, here the idea is that constructing these teams of hardware experts and algorithm experts will only get us so far. If you really want to go further, uh, you need to enable the software developers to design hardware. So to give you an, an example, right, today there's a, you look at machine learning, right? You've got one camp, which is the machine learning uh, experts, right? The people developing the networks and the algorithms and the flows. And you have chip designers on the very, very other end, right? And uh, the question is, right, could we build a bridge between those? Uh, so we have this idea, physical compiler, right, that takes Verilog and turns it into GDS2. If we had a machine learning to Verilog uh, generator or compiler, we'd actually have end-to-end, -end, meaning that somebody could, uh, you know, configure a network and turn it into silicon by the push of a button. And, and given how, <coughs> I talked about that ASIC optimization, right, with the weights and everything else, given how many unique networks there are, right, it's basically there's a network, a two network for every data space, every application. Uh, you can imagine one piece of silicon for every data set, and there is a, basically an infinite number of data sets. And all of this should be able to, to do, uh, should be possible in 24 hours. <coughs> The second one, right, where I can imagine this kind of make one of something is where places where you have extreme energy constraints. So things that are ruled by battery or energy harvesting. Um, so the, this DARPA N0 program uh, really tried to push the envelope in terms of standby energy and active energy to get it down to like 10 nanowatts uh, effective. And it's got a processor in there, right? Well, we know that an ASIC is more effective than a processor. There's no doubt about that. So we could reach even further if we wanted to fine tune an ASIC. And then the question is, well, what would you do with that? And I would leave that up as an exercise to the reader. Uh, but um, there are other examples, right? Extreme space constraints. You know, how far can we go, right? Can we go down to the cell level? We know that it's theoretically possible, right? You can take a few thousand transistors and push it down inside a, a human, human cell, right? Once we go down to, to seven and, uh, or, or three. Um, and what could you do with that, right? So every transistor counts from a space uh, perspective. From a cost perspective, so DARPA has a program called SHIELD, which is uh, for, um, um, against counterfeiting. Um, so the idea is that you, you should be able to label every electronic device and track it through the supply chain to make sure you can trust the device uh, inside your system. Well, that's 100 by 100 micron right now, right? That's, that's a big challenge. And uh, the 
question is, if you want to build in more intelligence than that, right, you might have to increase that. But this is a penny. So you can't go very far and still be able to label everything. Nobody's going to pay a dollar for this feature. So, so that's, uh, you know, cost constraint, extreme cost constraint. So this is one penny. Finally, for power. So uh, in, in supercomputers today, we basically build one system, one aggregate system that can do everybody's applications. And that's very expensive. That's the most general purpose thing you can imagine. So the performance is uh, terrible in terms of energy per, uh, performance per watt. Um, but what if you could actually design a system for a specific application? Then you could maybe build a system that's effectively 100 times bigger than what we're planning today. And then my final example, extreme uniqueness. Okay? So this is my, uh, I think this is the coolest one, which I haven't really thought uh, enough about, and I need your help. Um, but there's 7.6 billion individuals on Earth, right? Each one of them with unique, uh, unique DNA, unique history since birth, uh, unique physiology, personality, um, possibly security needs, right? Because it's, each one is a living and breathing person. So could we specialize for each person? Well, we know that you know, we have to bring the cost way, way down, right? Nobody's going to pay a $10 million cost to get an ASIC for themselves, like just as an equal one, that, unless you're a billionaire maybe. Um, but there's, not, there's only maybe a few thousand of those. Um, so, so we can bring the cost down to $500, which is somewhere in the healthcare space where people are paying you know, $25,000 a year in, in, in insurance. This is, this is within scope for sure. And then we have this machine learning ASICs, right, that we, we think could really improve people's lives uh, if we tune them for a certain person. So I would say that uh, I, have a, I have a pretty big hope for this area, that, uh, that you know, specializing, right? This is the talk to uh, semiconductor vendors. This is like IoT on steroids, right? This is like the next trillion dollars of revenue is going to come from here. Um, that's my prediction. So thank you. I think we have a good chunk of time for the questions. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you for that uh, very uh, inspiring talk. Um, I know my name Sharon, who uh, works in the Russian organization. So my question may be two questions kind of related. One is, um, uh, when you do this, at least from lots of the past year I've worked in this before, is whenever you automate things, you always sacrifice some quality. So at what level of the sacrifice will we consider to be so, so I, one, of the, the key, one of the key slides there showed that I, I put up 50% as, as acceptable, right? 50% um, of what, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so, so that, that's going to be fluid because there's so many test cases and, and, and benchmarks, right? Um, but, um, I, you know, I, I have the, the view is that uh, at the end of the day, it needs to be usable, right? So the, if you think of a compiler, right, a compiler, what is acceptable? You can, you can do, you know, can, you can test across, you know, 100 different applications, right, and you see where does the compiler do well, where does it do poorly, and that's where we're going to end up at the end of the day. So the question, I think, is was I talking about 50% average or 50% as the best case? I wasn't very clear on purpose. No, so, so, I, I, so I think the we just gonna. I, I talked to one semiconductor vendor, right, and, and uh, there, you know, I was like, "What are you gonna do with all that time we're gonna free up for you?" Because they were very interested in the silicon compilers. That we're just gonna innovate more, right? So I think that's a good answer. So it, you know, you take away the, the 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 hard work that adds very little value, which is you know drawing polygons and, and things like that, and you turn that into innovation. You're gonna do, uh, you know, more complex systems because. You know, you can move faster uh, because at the end of the day, a, a commercial company is constrained by time and money, right? That, that you can't get around that. You have to get your product to market and you have to get there with a certain investment. So those are your two kind of bounding conditions. And then you innovate with that in mind. 
So if we can get, you know, if we can spend less time, have less resources, we can get there faster, and we can do more products. Uh, so I, you know, you you need this does not replace the engineer. This replaces the drafting person. So, so the, there's a few different things going on in here um, in terms of open source and EDA, right? So for the silicon compiler, it's the no human loop that is the key concept, right? The open source was something I recommended because I thought it was such a, such a tough problem that no entity would be able to solve it on their own. And then from a collaboration perspective, if you don't have open source, you can't collaborate. Like, you, it just gets too hard. So you have, you know, imagine 10 different teams are they all going to sign a 10-way mutual NDA or maybe a joint venture or something like that to share the code? Let's just open source it and move forward. Uh, so, but, but in terms of the no human in the loop, I think the EDA um, industry, you see Cadence is part of, was part of our team there, right? So they're working on automated analog layout. And uh, um, so we have, uh, we have synopsis on the, on, the, on the effort as well. So I, I would say that uh, I c you can imagine there's some some hesitance to talk about open source, but uh, the goals are, are, are acceptable. The DDR4P costs a million bucks. Doesn't that mean you absolutely have to have open source? Or did you fail from the very start? Because if you just want to put together <coughs> a key to make something interesting, you're already out of it. So I think we have to be, I mean, we, ha we have to be careful when we talk about um, open source and code and anything in general, right? At the end of the day, you need a certain amount of energy to create that thing, and that you know can't create energy, right? So, so for a DDR controller to get a DDR controller that's open source that's equivalent to what Synopsis and Cadence are selling, it's going to take the same amount of effort and energy that they put into it. I don't see a, a, a bypass for that necessarily, and we're not trying to solve that problem. So, it's uh, it's to start with. I like to take the approach that 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 you know, Richard Stallman took and, and Linus did. You take the first step, you create something that's clearly much worse than the commercial offering, but you have to start somewhere. And, and you go from there. Yes? I'd like just to, to pick up on your last thought. I think it's a very noble project, and I'm a little bit skeptical that you will get to doing that, but if you do half of it, it will be already great for the community, <laughs> for the country, and the, so it's great to have it as a driver. I believe in the end, much of the success will be to keep some flexibility. So the result is to pay as you go. Because you have a system in which, if you really want your chip for 500 uh, bucks of uh, design work, you will get something. But if you're willing to put more, uh, you will get something better. And I think that the, the trick will be how you will envision something that's complex that will get the system vision, and then will use flows as subroutine for that, so that you can tune them and you will have to pay as you go. If you really want to have your high-end thing, you will use, let's say, synopsis, just to say a name, to the very end, and pay a cost for the physical design of that to the very end. But still, the overall frame should be open source, machine learning oriented. What do you think about that? <coughs> yeah, I, th I think once we move into the domain of uh, having a push-button something, then how you architect the compiler behind the end for the, for the designer, I think you leave a lot of freedom, right? You can imagine me saying compile chip and sending my job up to Amazon Cloud or somewhere else, right? And behind there, picking one of N flows, right, to, to implement. And one will be the free version, the freemium, right, which will be pretty bad, but it'll serve a certain class of customers. And then, you know, if you want better performance, there might be a proprietary one or it may be a... Uh, um, so you, you can see how um, there's still a lot of money to be made in this approach. But it is, you, you, yeah, once you go silicon compiler and you don't have an API for tweaking all the knobs, right, for all the parameters, right? So we ha today we have an API that's uh, designer driven, right? We have 500 commands or so to go, you know, RTL to GDS2. Each command has maybe 10 knobs we need to tune. And, uh, and then experts, you know, designers, need to figure out how to do that on every node. And uh, I think the question is, once we take the human on the loop, first of all, the API is not needed. 
right? We can go back to the raw algorithm and open up the whole space, and then um, then we're we're in a, we're a completely different design paradigm. We don't have APIs anymore. A, a designer-driven APIs. We have machine-driven APIs. Yes. question so 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 fortunately we don't have to invent solutions to this our own I mean the software industry has had this for 30 years now and at the end of the day you need the, the people on the ground right you need the people to own the the, the code base forever right uh, and so um, and that's gonna take money so somehow you have to pump money into the system right either through profits so this is what EDA companies do right they sell something get profit they make the tool better make more profit and so forth um, it could be something like the Linux Foundation, right, where the industry decides that this is a good thing to have and the foundation collects fees from everybody and that funds a certain, certain number of developers. That's kind of like a, a, a co-op in a way, right? So there, you know, there, there are a few different models like that. You've got the Red Hat model where there's an open source code base and somebody makes uh, a, a good profit from servicing that code base, right, and, and selling to people who don't want to have developers in-house. So there's, those are three, three models I can imagine working going forward. But yeah, absolutely, you, you, you know, nothing's free in this world. No, I, I think that, that doesn't, DARPA doesn't do that. DARPA funds research, right? And so we don't, found, we don't start companies. It's the government, right? The government doesn't start companies. So, um, um, you know, but it's open source, so anybody could start a company, right? It's, that's part of the freedom of open source. Okay, thank you. So, I have a question regarding the um, IPs. So it's as of today, it's not like we don't have the open source IPs, but one of the reasons that open source IP is not well reused or used, particularly in the commercial you know, sector, is because I don't know what it does. I cannot trust right. that IPs, and maybe it doesn't meet my spec criteria. So how can you kind of reconcile this problem in your program? So, uh, so I think that there's, there's two things um, that, that we're doing in the program. Um, one is the formal analysis work, right? So, so the idea is that you can actually, if, if, you, if you're willing to write the properties, right, that you, you want to confirm, then we can prove that it does exactly that. Um, so that's the formal analysis part. And the second one, let's say we want to uh, simulate, right, and go up the stack. So actually many times when, if you want to build an ASIC, um, you're not necessarily doing the heavy-duty uh, design verification you would do for a general-purpose uh, platform, like you know, from a big semiconductor company, where you're running random uh, regression, you're doing assertions, uh, and you're doing you're booting Linux. You just want to be able to run your algorithm, and you're done, right? So, um, even though the platform could be able to do a lot more things, right? But you want to run one application, and if you can meet that one, you, you take that. So, for something like that, we need like an emulation platform or a simulation platform. So. Uh, so Xilinx is working on a, uh, a co-simulation platform, completely open source, based on System C, Axi, TLMs, um, and, and FPGAs, right? In, in kind of a hybrid hardware software platform. So if you had software code and the, 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 the checkpoint whether it works or not, I download a component from open cores or wherever, I put it in, and it works under my simulation okay. conditions, and it passes STA, like, you know what? I'm going to take a chance on this. Right, uh, maybe, um, but uh, so that so that is kind of like the uh, if it if it works in simulation, I'm going to use it, and that is yeah. the software approach, right? If you download a piece of code from the internet and you're able to use it, you go with it. Okay. Yeah. Yes.
So each each research team has their own pat, uh, patent and, and, and copyright approach, right? So the majority of the university teams chose either GPL or uh, BSD. So that that's their that's their plan. Um, and in terms of patents, um, it's a little bit of an unexplored area. So you know, there's people who put a you know BSD or MIT license on there because they're either they're that's convenient or um, if they a little bit more conservative might put Apache, which has sort of a patent clause, but there has been no open source hardware, right? Certainly not commercially, so it hasn't been tested, right? So, so the idea is that somebody might put a BSD license on a on a Verilla piece of Verilog code, but there's a patent in there. What do you do? So I think there there will be some interesting questions around that. Okay, I think we have time for just one more question. Yep. Analog and, and digital. Digital, uh, digital circuit, yeah. and I'm uh, skeptical about the uh, approach. I, 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 I'm asking if you just jump from the original pipeline with many stages and go into an end-to-end -end system directly. Just, I mean, because in traditional design, you have many stages, right? Then you just jump from the many stages into an end-to-end -end system, or you replace part of some stages into an automatic system. Um, so I mean it's going to be up to the to the research teams, right? But I think as a as a first stab, if you take a, an RTL to GDS flow, which has a certain number of stages, right? A logic synthesis, you got a global placement, a global routing, clock tree synthesis, and detailed routing, and so forth. So each step will be replaced one by one. So, and so is the end goal is the end goal end to end system? Yeah, and the, and the analog and digital are completely separate. Okay. So there's not like a a um, you know grand th unified theory of placement right for analog and digital right the analog engine is completely separate from the digital engine. Yeah. Let, let me take the um, last question. <laughs> also, <laughs> <laughs> reminding you that this is a CEDA sponsored event. So, is there any room where CEDA or IEEE can contribute to this open source based on initiative for the community? You think? I mean, I'd you know, love, you know, think, sure, we'd love to come share some of our results at some point, right? So uh, that'd be one, one okay. thing, right? Uh, so the first kind of checkpoint is a year in, so a DAC uh, next year. Okay. Right, so we'll, that should be, we should have some real results by then. Great. All right. Let's thank our speaker one more time. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending this um, keynote speech. It's a small token of appreciation always. Raise the uh, small prize. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you.